reigned over the entire world. And here what we see is God pronouncing judgment upon Egypt or upon the kingdom that reigned over the world. I believe that this starts off the picture of God judging the whole world. Now this plague is of course one of God's judgments. He refers to it as a judgment many times before this, referring to the plagues. So this is the beginning and, and it kind of lays the foundation of God judging the whole world. God judging the world. A day in which God judges the world. Notice there it says this, And the Lord said unto Moses, Yet will I bring one plague more upon Pharaoh and upon Egypt. And he goes on, afterwards he will let you go hence. So this is the beginning of the picture where he is judging the whole world. Acts chapter number 17 verse number 31 tells us this, Because he hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men in that he hath raised him from the dead. So it's interesting to stop and think about the day of judgment, the great white throne judgment, that God has actually chosen out a particular and a specific day in the which he will judge the world. God knows the exact day in the which all of mankind are going to stand before him and have to answer for the life that they've lived. All of mankind are going to have to stand before him and be judged by the almighty creator. God has a calendar, if you will, and he knows the exact day, he knows the exact hour, and he he knows the exact time. And it says that he has appointed a day. So he set this day apart. That's exactly what took place here in Exodus chapter number 11. He set this time apart and he set this day apart and God was going to pour this judgment out. And he actually had a very specific time and appointed a time in the which he was going to pour this judgment out. Look at verse number 4. It says this, And Moses said, Thus saith the Lord, About midnight will I go out into the mist of Egypt. So notice that he had a time in the which he was going to judge the world. He appointed a specific time in the which he was going to bring this judgment upon the world. I want you to look with me now at Exodus chapter number 11 verse number 5. Exodus chapter number 11 verse number 5 it says this, And all the firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die from the firstborn of Pharaoh that sitteth upon his throne, even unto the firstborn of the maidservant that is behind the mill, and all the firstborn of beasts. Now God emphasizes something here, and he's very, very clear to make this point, that it's all, that it is every single person. Notice he says, and all the firstborn in the land of Egypt. Now what does Egypt represent? It represents the world. So he says, all the firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die. This is, of course, those that are going to be guilty of his judgment. It says then, from the firstborn of Pharaoh that sitteth upon his throne, even unto the firstborn of the maidservant that is behind the, the mill, excuse me, and all the firstborn of beast. You should have your bulletin there. I want you to flip over back over to Revelation chapter number 20. Revelation chapter number 20. I want you to notice the similarities between the day of judgment. So what he's pointing out is that there are no exemptions. There are no exceptions. There is no one that is excluded from this particular judgment. Every single person in Egypt will at this point be judged by God. Every single one of them. And notice that he, he divides them into social classes. He says from Pharaoh, which would be the uppers, which would be the kings. And he says all the way down to the maidservant that grinds at the mill. So what he's saying is from the pauper, from the poor man to the prince, right? From, you know, the king or the captain, if you will, all the way down to the captive. To him that is free, also to him that is a bond servant or a bond man. There is no one that will be excluded from this judgment. I want you to look at Revelation chapter number 20. Revelation chapter number 20. And I want you to look with me at verse number 12. Verse number 12. It says this, And I saw the dead, <clears throat> small and great, stand before God and the books were open. Now when the Bible says small and great, it's not talking about, you know, midgets and giants. It's not talking about short people and tall people. It's actually talking about significance or importance. When it says small, it's talking about people that have less importance in, in the sense of, you know, social classes as I'd already talked about. It's talking about those that were maybe bond servants. It's talking about those that were maybe just the working class. Those that would maybe be, if we looked around at this world today, would be considered lower class. 
class. Maybe, maybe if you would even go so far as to say the homeless. Maybe if you would go so far as to say the vagrants, the transients, the hobos, people that are, are out there that, that really have no pull in this world. But then it also says the small and the great. Do you know what that's talking about? That's talking about Donald Trump. That's talking about Alexander the Great. That's talking about Pharaoh himself. So it's talking about the small, those that don't have much importance, those that don't have much influence, those that don't have much significance, but also the great. Just like on the day of judgment when God poured out his judgment upon Egypt, being a picture of the world, he said from the, from the firstborn in the house of Pharaoh, also all the way down to the firstborn of the maidservant. No one was excluded. No one was excluded. On the day of judgment, the great white throne judgment, no one will be excluded. No one will have an exemption. Not based upon a social class. Your importance and your pull in this world is not going to help you even a tiny bit. It's not going to help you at all. All of the powerful men, all of the men that, that are, are, you know, have, have much, as I said, influence in this world today, they're going to have zero influence when they get to heaven and they stand before the great white throne judgment. It's not going to help them at all. It's not going to help them even a tiny bit. And I don't know if you've pictured this in your mind before, but I hope that that's uh, what this is able to do for you with these illustrations this morning. When I think of and I imagine the great white throne judgment, I always picture a line of people. A line of people standing before the throne of God. And one thing that I often do because of that verse where he says, and I saw you know, uh, uh, the dead, small and great, stand before God. It kind of illustrates this idea that they're standing before God and they're almost waiting in line to be judged. And he says the small and great. So what I do in my own mind is, is I start thinking of people that, that I know or that I've heard of that maybe would fall into that category of small. You know, there, there are certain people, you know, that, uh, you know that, uh, that I can relate to maybe that would fall in the category of small. There was a guy, I don't know if my wife will remember this, but there's a guy in a city Newport, that, the city of Newport, very close to where we both live, that was called the quarter guy. Everybody called him the quarter guy. He had been homeless for probably 30, 40 years. And you know what he said every time he saw you? He never asked for a dollar. He never asked for a dime. But he always says, hey, can I get a quarter? Hey, can I get a quarter? Everybody in the town knew who he was. Everybody in the city, and we lived in a large city, everybody knew who he was. You remember the quarter guy? You do. He'd say, hey, can I get a quarter? Everybody talk about him. You know, they, you know uh, people would joke about him. The quarter guy. The quarter guy is going to be standing in that line. But you know who else is going to be in the line? Not only the small, but the great. You know who else is going to be in that line? Barack Obama. And sometimes what I'll picture is there's going to be no specific order. God's not going to break people up in social classes when you're standing in line and waiting to be judged. You're going to have the quarter guy, but then you're going to have somebody along the lines of maybe, you know, King Ed or Prince Edward right in front of him. Maybe after him you'll have Herod. Maybe after him, you know, maybe, you know, some transient in Jacksonville. Some guy that's just traveling through Jacksonville today. Maybe after that person, you'll just have just, just a regular, old, maybe your neighbor will be standing in line. So there, there, is no, there are no exemptions. There is, we're not going to be broken into social classes. That's irrelevant and that doesn't matter. It, it's not going to matter the, the, you know, the pull and the influence that you had in this world. Just like the night that God poured out his wrath and his judgment came upon Egypt and upon the world at that time, it affected Pharaoh and it affected the maidservants. The maidservants' child firstborn died just as well as Pharaoh's firstborn died also. I want you to go back to Exodus, please, if you would. Not only does your social standing help you or the social class that you fall into, but also your race or your nationality is going to be irrelevant. It's going to be irrelevant. God is not a respecter of persons. God is not going to respect your race. God is not going to respect your nationality. The Bible says in the book of Isaiah that all the nations are before God as of nothing. And then he goes on to say, and less of nothing. You know, it's less than nothing. You know, that's not going to impress God. The nation that you are from, the nation that you come from, that's not going to help you even a tiny bit. Not only that, the color of your skin is not going to help you a tiny bit. He's not going to divide people up and, and you know, where, where, where white people are going to be over here and then red people and yellow people and black people. That's not going to matter at all. Right. 
The Indian man's going to be standing, and you know, the Native American is going to be standing, you know, in front of the white guy. And then the white guy's going to be standing next to the black guy. And then the black guy's going to be standing next to the Chinese guy. It's not going to matter. Right. And they're all going to be from, from different backgrounds. It's all going to be mixed up. It's not going to matter. It, it, it's, it, where you come from is going to be 100% irrelevant that day. And it was the same at the, the night of the judgment that God poured out. The, the Israelites, just by nature of their ethnicity or of their father, they were not immune and they were not exempt. I want you to look at Exodus chapter number 12, verse number 23. It says this, For the Lord will pass through to smite the Egyptians. Watch this. And when he seeth the blood upon the lentil and on the two side posts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not suffer the destroyer, watch this, to come in unto your houses to smite you. Now I want you to notice that yes, there was in this sense an exemption, but it had nothing to do with their ethnicity. It had nothing to do with who their father was. It had nothing to do with what nation that they came from. That did not help them at all. It didn't matter what region that they lived in. That's not what helped them. The only thing that helped them was the fact that they had the blood on the doorpost. It didn't matter whether or not that they were an Israelite. It didn't matter whether or not that Abraham was their father. It's the exact same thing that John the Baptist warned the Pharisees of. He said, Think not to say unto yourselves that we have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. So on the day of judgment, it's not going to matter whether you're an Israelite. You know what else is not going to matter? It's not going to matter whether you are an American. It's not going to matter what nation, what country, what ethnicity. That's not going to matter. It's going to be the firstborn from the small to the great. It's going to be the firstborn from the prince to the pauper, from, you know, as I said, the captain to the captive, the free to the bond. It's not going to matter. Your social standing will be irrelevant. Your nationality will be irrelevant. The influence and the power that you had in this world is going to be irrelevant. You're just going to be standing there as a soul before God. That's all that you will have. That is it. I want you to look now at... Exodus chapter number 11, verse number 1. I want to point out something else about, about this. The Bible says, verse 1, And the Lord said unto Moses, Yet will I bring one plague more upon Pharaoh and upon Egypt. So notice what he says. I will bring, I will bring one plague more. One plague more upon Pharaoh. Those that are familiar with the story of when God is smiting the land of, the land of Egypt, you will know that there were nine plagues before this. And what is this? This is the final judgment. This is the last judgment. And do you know what the great white throne is? It's the final judgment. It's the great white throne judgment. You're at the end of the rope. You have no more opportunities. This is it. You don't have, you don't have a second chance. There, you know, there is no you know, uh, opportunity for a plea bargain. You're not going to be able to appeal your case, if you will, when you stand before God. This is it. You are at the end of your rope. They had nine plagues before this, and God gave them opportunity after opportunity to get it right. right. But this was the tenth plague, and he says, and I'll, I'll bring one more. This is going to be the last one. The great white throne judgment is the final judgment. It's when all of mankind stands before the creator of the earth. All of God's creation began with Adam and Eve and billions, trillions even, of souls have existed and have lived since the beginning of creation. Trillions. Every last one of them are going to stand before God. Every last one of them. It's the final judgment of all of the purpose of life, the creation. Everyone is going to stand before God at this moment. Just like that night. He said, yet will I bring one plague more upon Pharaoh. It's the final judgment. It's the final judgment. I want you to look over at Exodus chapter number 5. Exodus chapter number 5. Now with the first nine plagues, of course, they did not uh, uh, repent. They did not at this point, you know, allow, Pharaoh that is, allow the people to go. But this judgment is a judgment where everyone was humbled. This tenth plague or this tenth judgment that God brought, it brought humility to every single person. Pharaoh continually was flexing himself when Moses would come to him. He was mocking God. He was mocking the Lord. He was, he was hardening his heart. He was stiffening his neck. Moses would come after one plague after the next, and he continually turn, you know, turned Moses away, sent Moses back. Did not hearken unto the voice of the preacher. 
Exodus chapter number 5 verse number 2 said this, And Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? I know not the Lord, neither will I let Israel go. So notice, does, does, does Pharaoh sound humbled at all at this point? Not even slightly. Does he sound scared of the Lord? Not even a tiny bit. Not even a little bit. He says, Who is the Lord that I should let his people go? He's not concerned. He's not worried. How, what is he? He's, 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 very, he's very proud, isn't he, in his speech. I want you to look at Exodus chapter number 12. Exodus chapter number 12. I want you to notice that after the final judgment or at the final judgment, the final judgment, the tenth judgment, when God judged the world at that time, that he confessed the Lord. Look at, and I'm not saying that he got saved, but we're looking at types here. Look at Exodus chapter number 12, verse number 31. He confessed him with his lips. Exodus chapter number 12, verse number 31, the Bible says this, And he called for Moses and Aaron by night and said, Rise up and get you forth from among my people, both ye and the children of Israel, and go, serve the Lord as ye have said. So notice that after this judgment, once this judgment had occurred, what happened? It kind of changed his attitude a little bit, didn't it? He was, he was humbled a little bit more, didn't he? Yeah, I want you to go to... Uh, I want you to turn now to Exodus chapter number 11. Just go back one chapter, Exodus chapter number 11. Not only did Pharaoh confess the name of the Lord there in Exodus chapter number 12, but the people, they go and they bow. I want you to look at Exodus chapter number 11, verse number 8. <clears throat> they finally bow. After all of these plagues, it took the final judgment for them to bow. Look at verse 8. And all these thy servants shall come down unto me and bow down themselves unto me, saying, Get thee out, and all the people that follow thee, and after that I will go out. And he went out from Pharaoh in a great anger. So notice that he warned him about this, that this is going to be a judgment unlike any judgment. This is going to be the final judgment. And you've been proud, you know, your whole life. You've been haughty and lofty your whole life. And these other plagues, they weren't enough for you. But this judgment is going to be different. This judgment is going to be the final judgment. And there is going to be no proud looks. There isn't going to be any lofty speeches. There isn't going to be, you know, this, this, this haughty attitude any longer. You're going to come and you're going to bow. Well, the same thing is going to happen at the great white throne judgment. There are, there are many people that hate the Lord. You know, for us that love God and love His Word, that can be difficult sometimes to grasp. But the Bible's real clear. It talks about people that hate God. It talks about people that hate the Lord. It talks about people that love violence. It talks about wicked, evil people. Very evil people. There are people, when we go out soul winning... You know, how many times have you knocked on somebody's door and you can just see the hatred for the Bible and the hatred for God when you start to talk, for, talk to them? You can see atheists who immediately want to start mocking you and making fun of you. They want to mock the God of, of the Bible. They want to mock the different things. You'll knock on their door and within two minutes they're, they're trying to bring up, you know, all of the things about the Old Testament. Of, of, that they hate about God's justice and all of His laws and stuff. And they'll sit there and they'll mock and they'll make fun of these things. Right. But let me tell you this, that there's going to be a day when they stand before God. There's going to be a final judgment, just like the Egyptians had a final judgment. Just like they and Pharaoh were very proud and lofty and haughty. There's going to be a day when they stand before God and they're going to be humbled. They're not going to have that same lofty, haughty attitude that they had throughout their whole life. They're not going to have this attitude. You know, Richard Dawkins, all of these people that want to curse and mock God and make fun of God. They want to, you know, uh, make fun of the Bible. I can promise you this one thing that Richard Dawkins will not have a proud look the day that he stands before God. He is going to stand in that line and he is going to be shaking in his boots. He is going to be terrified and he is going to be humbled. Romans chapter number 14 verse number 10 says this, But why dost thou judge thy brother? Or why dost thou set it not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, As I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. I want you to notice that it says, Every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. There are no exemptions. There are no exceptions. There's no amnesty. There is, you, you are not immune to this. Every single person that has ever lived, the, 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 the proud man, the humble man, it's not going to matter. 
You are going to be humbled the day that you stand before God. You are going to be humbled the day that you stand before the great white throne judgment. Uh, just like the Bible tells us about Jesus, it says, God hath given him a name which is above every name. It says that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. And then it goes further to say this, of things in heaven and things on earth, and it says, and things under the earth. Do you know what that means? The people that are in heaven now and the people that are on earth. It says the things in heaven, the things on earth, and then it says this, and the things under the earth. So that means every single person that has rejected the Lord. That's, that's including Pharaoh again a second time. That's including every single person that has mocked and made fun of the Bible, mocked and hated God. Those that have so proudly and arrogantly rejected the Lord, they will bow their knee whether they want to or not. Amen. Whether they want to or not, they will bow their knee and they will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Pharaoh was forced to, to confess. Pharaoh was forced to confess. And all the Egyptians, you know what they did? They came and they bowed before him. They came and they bowed. They were proud before that. But this judgment was, was too much. This judgment was, was more than what they could handle. Look at uh, uh, Exodus chapter number 11 now. One other thing that's very interesting is the Lord put a difference between Egypt and Israel. So he put a difference between God's people and the heathen at the judgment. He put a difference between the saved and the unsaved. Look at Exodus chapter number 11, verse number 7. But against any of the children of Israel shall not a dog move his tongue against man or beast, that ye may know how that the Lord doth put a difference between the Egyptians and Israel. Israel. I want you to notice he said that not even a dog will move his tongue. What's he saying? He's, he's just trying to exaggerate the point that you're not going to be hurt at all. That there's going to be no power of the destroyer or of the angel that's going to hurt you. Now, what was the angel referred to as? The death angel, right? Look at Revelation chapter number 20. Revelation chapter number 20. <clears throat> it says in Revelation chapter number 20, verse number 6, I believe. I don't have this in my notes, but I believe it is. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. Now watch this. On such the second death hath no power. Now this is of course in context. It's talking about the time of right before the judgment. I want you to notice how there's a difference between the Israelite as we saw and the Egyptian. Right? There's a difference between the saved and the unsaved. That night when the, when the death angel passed over... When the, the destroyer passed over, there was a difference between the Egyptian and the Israelite. On the Israelite, the death angel, the death, had no power. That's how it's going to be also on the day of judgment. The, the, the second death shall have no power. Amen. Exodus chapter number 11, uh, verse 7, as I said, says this, But against any of the children of Israel shall not a dog move his tongue. It shall have no power. There's a difference, he said, between the Israelite and the Egyptian. Matthew 25, 31, Jesus speaking about the day of judgment. He says this, When the Son of Man shall come in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. And then he says this, And before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another. As a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. So once you notice on the day of judgment, there is going to be a real dividing. And he's going to bring, when everyone stands there, there are going to be those that are going to be judged on this day that are going to be found guilty. But then there are going to be these over here that are separated and that are divided. So there's going to be a division made. So it's going to be very obvious who the second death is about to have power on. It's going to be very obvious who is about to be condemned, but then also who is going to be delivered. It's going to be very obvious who the Egyptians are and who the Israelites are. It's going to be very obvious. He's going to put a difference between the Israelite and the Egyptian on that day. There's going to be a difference there. He's going to separate, separate the sheep and the goats. You know what he's going to do? He's going to separate God's people from the heathen. He's going to separate the saved from the unsaved. There's going to be a dividing. I don't know if you've, you've thought about this and you've pictured this. I hope this help, helps you to illustrate this idea and thought in your mind. But he is going to divide people up. You're not going to be standing next to a family member that's unsaved. You're not going to be standing next to a co-worker that's unsaved. You're going to be over here on this side where God's people are standing with the sheep. And then there's going to be this big long line of people over here that are the Egyptians, that are the goats. He's going to put a difference there. And on this line over here, this group of people, the second death's going to have no power. 
The death angel's not going to hurt them at all. But these people over here, they're going to lose their firstborn. There is going to be a second death there. Not only that, this is something I've thought about a lot. Go to Exodus chapter number 11. Again, look at verse number 3. The night of the plague, of the final judgment, the Bible tells you that there was a cry that was heard in the land such as had never been heard before. Cry is referring to people screaming out. Uh, not only, you know, most of the time when people are crying, they are weeping as well, but a cry is referring to people just yelling out and screaming out. Look at Exodus chapter number 11, <clears throat> verse number 3. It says this, And the Lord gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. Moreover, <clears throat> Moreover, the man Moses was very great in the land of Egypt, in the sight of Pharaoh's servants, and in the sight of the people. Verse 4, and, and Moses said, Thus saith the Lord, About midnight will I go out into the midst of Egypt, and all the firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die, from the firstborn of Pharaoh that sitteth, sitteth upon his throne, even unto the firstborn of the maidservant that is behind the mill, and all the firstborn of beasts. Verse 6, and there shall be a great cry throughout all the land of Egypt. And it says this, such as there was none like it, nor shall be like it any more. Now right there he's discussing specifically the land of Egypt. And he's saying that in the land of Egypt, you know, this is a picture of the world of course, that at that time there had never been a cry like that. And in the land of Egypt there will never be a cry like that again. He says a great cry. What he's talking about is people screaming out. Now, I don't know, it, it, you know, I, I really often try to do this, as I've mentioned already. I try to imagine and picture these things and meditate upon the Bible when I read it. And I try to think about exactly what this would be like to experience and what it would be like to hear and actually how this happened. Because the death angel goes out at midnight. Now, the majority of people are sleeping at midnight, right? Most people would be in bed. Most people would be asleep. But, of course, the death angel goes out at midnight and... and you know, there had to have been a time when the cries started, when something woke everyone up. And the way that I've always pictured this and the way that I've always imagined this, and I could be wrong, was this. I always imagined, you know, the mother with the nursing child, or the mother that maybe had a child that was sick, or the mother that had something wrong while she, and being with her firstborn that maybe she had to continually go back and check on her child every few hours. And maybe she had been asleep from 9 o'clock. Maybe she had been asleep, you know, maybe from 10 o'clock. Maybe she had just been asleep at 11. Maybe she even just was in the other room. Maybe she had a, a very bad sickness with her firstborn and she was just very concerned and worried about it. And she just so decided because of her worry at 12.30 she was going to walk in there. Maybe at 12.10. Because, you know, I'm sure there's millions of Egyptians. She walked into the bedroom of her firstborn and she walked over to her firstborn child and she looked down and you know what she saw? She noticed he wasn't breathing. She, maybe she put her thumb in his neck and, and noticed that he had no pulse. Maybe, maybe it was 30 minutes afterwards. Maybe she, she noticed that this, this is a dead lifeless body and she feels down and he's already getting cold. And you know the very first thing that she's going to do? You know what a mother's going to do in that kind of moment? She's going to scream out. She's going to scream like you've never heard a scream before. And you know what that's going to do? That's going to wake up the neighbor. That's going to wake up their next door neighbor. And you know what their next door neighbor is going to do? They're going to, they're going to wake up frantically. They're going to be looking around trying to figure out what's going on. They're going to be worried. And you know what they're probably going to do is they're probably going to go wake up their kids. Maybe they go to the third, the third born first, the second. Maybe they went straight to the first born. They went to go wake up their first born. You know what they noticed? Their first born's dead. You know what they're going to do? They're going to be screaming out the top of their lungs, screaming out. Do you know what the next person's going to do? It's going to wake up their neighbor. This continually goes on for hours and hours and hours. I don't know if you've sat back and imagined the devastation that took place in Egypt and how many people died and what took place. And they're just continual screams for hours and hours of people at the top of their lungs just screaming out. I mean, there's, there's, there's hardly anything that could, that could compel or provoke such a scream as your firstborn son finding him dead in bed. There's very few things that, that could be that bad. On the great white throne judgment, it's going to be the final judgment. 
And you know what's going to happen is a lot of people are going to look and they're going to see their firstborn son standing in that line. They're going to see their brother standing in that line. They're going to see their mother. They're going to see their father standing in line about to approach judgment. They're going to see many family members standing there about to walk up to this throne. And over and over again, you know, what's, you know what you're going to see? Somebody's firstborn thrown into hell. Somebody's firstborn grabbed and bound hand and foot, as Jesus said, and cast into outer darkness. What do you, how do you think they're going to be reacting? They're standing before the God of the universe in all His glory and in all His power and in all His might. And there are going to be glorious angels standing by. They are going to be terrified. This is going to be a sight like they have never seen before. And there are going to be a difference between the Israelites and the Egyptians. There's going to be a lot of saved people they are going to stand there and watch their firstborn bound hand and foot thrown into outer darkness. There's going to be a lot of, a lot of saved people they are going to see uncles and aunts and family members. And you know what you're going to see? Screams. People are going to be screaming. People are going to... How do you think people are going to be acting? When, when they're standing before God, think about being brought out of hell after, let's say, a thousand years and you stand before God for judgment and you're found guilty. How would you act? You'd be screaming at the top of your lungs, begging for mercy, pleading for any opportunity. It's going to be one person after the next screaming for mercy, screaming for help, screaming for God to give them a second chance. But it's the final judgment. There are no second chances. There isn't a second chance. Just like for Egypt, there was no second chances. This was it. There's no plea bargain. There's no appealing to the court. It's over. It's done. No second chances. They're going to be grabbed. They're going to be bound hand and foot. And they're going to be thrown into outer darkness. It's going to be exactly the same. People have this idea that, that you know, go to Revelation 21 and we'll look at this. People, a lot of people I've heard, you know, say when we get to heaven... There's going to be no crying. No one's going to be crying. As soon as you go to heaven, you get to heaven, there's going to be no crying at all. That's not true. Now, there, there's a point where there's no crying. There's a point where there's no weeping. There's a point that comes where there's no more sadness. Right. And do you know when the Bible specifically points out when that time is? Immediately after the great white throne judgment. The Bible, when it talks about the, the time of the great tribulation, it tells you that there are souls under the altar that are crying to God. These men are in heaven, and these are the martyrs, and they died, and their souls went to heaven, and they're crying to God. Right now, they're still crying in heaven. There is crying in heaven right now. But there's a time where there's no more crying. I want you to look at Revelation chapter number 21. And, and, and this is not, I don't believe, a coincidence at all. Revelation chapter 20, of course, is where we read about the great white throne. That ends in verse 15, the devastating story of the great white throne judgment. But then it says in Revelation 21, right after that, And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. So, what is on their eyes at this moment? What is he doing? It says that he's going to wipe away all tears from their eyes. Do you know what's going to be going on at the great white throne judgment? There's going to be a lot of crying. There's going to be a lot of screaming out. There's going to be a lot, a lot of tears shed. It's going to be very similar unto the situation, the devastating situation that took place in Egypt thousands of years ago. There were mothers, there were fathers, there were brothers, there were uncles, everyone, the whole town, just throngs of people screaming out and crying. That's going to be very similar to what the great white throne judgment is going to look like. It's going to be a lot of sadness. And you know what, God? There's going to be a point where God is going to, where there's going to be no more crying. When that takes place is Revelation 21. You know when it is? Right after, right after the great white throne. And it tells you he's going to wipe away all tears from their eyes. What's in their eyes? Tears. There's going to be tears in their eyes. People are going to be crying. They're going to be crying for their firstborn. Just like in Egypt, the, the maidservant all the way to Pharaoh, what were they doing? They were crying for their firstborn. I want you to go back to the book of Exodus. Go back to the book of Exodus. This is going to be my last point. <clears throat> I had a few others, but this is going to be my last point. I'm going to skip the other ones. This was, <clears throat> this was a night of judgment, of course, of great judgment. But it was also a night of mercy. 
There was also there was, a, there was a night of judgment in the sense that there was a lot of people condemned. There were a lot of people judged. This was a night of great death and destruction. It's a night of, 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 a, of a lot of death and destruction. So many people died this night. I mean, you have to think, millions of Egyptians, how many firstborn were there? And, and not only this, I don't know if you've thought about this in those homes where the firstborn child died of the mother, but guess what? There were a lot of mothers that were the firstborn too. So it wasn't the mom that found the child sometimes. You know who it was? It was the father who just so happened to be the, the second born in his family. So in the same household, he goes over to check his firstborn son and he notices that his firstborn son's dead. But not only that, his wife just so happened to be the firstborn in her family. You know what he does? He goes over to wake up his wife to tell her the devastating news. And not only is his firstborn son, maybe daughter, dead, but also his wife is dead. This was a night of great destruction, great death, great sadness. Very similar unto the, the judgment that will take place at the great white throne. But even though there was a lot of condemnation, even though there was a lot of judgment, it was a night of great mercy. It was a night of great mercy. You know, of course, the, the Israelites were warned. They were given the warning that they must apply the blood of the lamb to the doorpost. You must apply the blood of the lamb to the doorpost. They were told that. But let me, let me ask you this question. Do you think that the Israelites slept like a baby that night? Do you think they just went to sleep and slept like a baby? Or do you think that they were, that they were probably a little bit nervous? Do you think that they, this, their mind was, was, was consumed with what was about to happen? They were just constantly thinking about this and thinking about what was going to happen. When they heard those screams and those yells, what do you think they did? What do you think? What would you do? I'd go, you know, I, you, they were aware of what was going to happen. The Egyptians, they didn't know. You know what they did? They went into the other room and they looked down and they checked their firstborn. You know what they saw? He was sleeping like a baby. He's, he's alive, he's well. There's nothing wrong with him. What happened? They were spared. God showed mercy upon that house. Now with all the, 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 the panic that's going on, how good do you think that that would make you feel? How happy, how much joy do you think that that would bring to your heart to know that God spared you? So uh, keep your hand here in Exodus. Let's look at Revelation chapter number 20 as well. I'm sorry to have you turn there so quickly. We're going to look at two places here. Uh, yeah. So get your, get your hand in, in Revelation 20, if you still have it. <clears throat> we will, I'm sorry to go back and forth, we will look at Exodus first. Look at Exodus chapter 12. Look at Exodus chapter 12. I want to uh, read what they were required to do in order to, to receive mercy. Look at verse number 3, it says, Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month they shall take to them every man a lamb. According to the house of their fathers, a lamb for an house. And if the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next unto his house take it according to the number of the souls. Every man according to his eating shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish. A male of the first year, you shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats. And ye shall keep it up until the fourteenth day of the same month. And the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. And they shall take of the blood and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper door post of the houses wherein they shall eat it. And they shall eat the flesh in that night, roast with fire, and unleavened bread, and with bitter herbs they shall eat it. Eat not of it raw, nor sodden at all with water, but roast with fire. His head with his legs, and with, his, and with the pertinence thereof. And ye shall let nothing of it remain until the morning. And that which remaineth of it until the morning, ye shall burn with fire. And thus shall ye eat, with your loins girded, your shoes on your feet and your staff in your hand. And you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. And then he says this in verse 13. And the blood shall be to you for a token 
upon the houses where ye are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. Amen. This is, of course, where we get the song. And the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. And if you skip down in verse number 21... He says this, Then Moses called for all the elders of Israel and said unto them, Draw out and take you a lamb according to your families and kill the Passover. And you shall take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood that is in the basin and strike the lintel and the two side posts with the blood that is in the basin. And none of you shall go out at the door of his house until the morning. For the Lord will pass through to smite the Egyptians. And when he seeth the blood upon the lintel and on the two side posts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not suffer the destroyer to come in unto your houses. And he says this, to smite you. Now if you go over to Revelation chapter number 20, <clears throat> we're told something very, very interesting here in Revelation chapter number 20. And I love the way that it's worded. So you see the, the dead, small and great, of course, stand before God. They're all brought. This is, of course, referring to the unsaved when it says the dead. They're all brought. And it says this in verse number 12. And the books were opened. And then it says this. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books. Notice that. According to their works. Now, here's the picture. What happens this day is there's the dead and there's the living. There's the unsaved and the saved. There's the Israelites and the Egyptians. And the Egyptians are all the dead on the day of judgment. They're, they are those that are dead, small and great. And the Bible says that there are two sets of books, if you will. There are the books, plural, over here. And this, is, this contains the, you know, basically every single person's life pinned down on paper. Every work that you've ever done, bad and good. And it says that the dead were judged out of the things written in the books, plural. So notice that they are judged according to their works. They are judged according to the things that are written down uh, uh, based upon the things that they did in their life. Right? But then this group over here, they're not judged based upon the things according to their works. Look at verse number 14 now. Or look at verse... 13, because it repeats the same thing. It says, And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged, every man according to their works. Notice, every man, they're judged according to their works. So all of the dead, all of the unsaved, they're going to be judged out of the things written in the books. But then there's also this other book over here. Look at verse 14. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Now, so what's the result of those that are judged according to their works? According to the things that they did in their life. It says in death and hell. That's the dead. That's those that were brought up. The dead were brought up. The sea gave up the dead which were in them. Which were, which were in it, I'm sorry. And death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. Got those backwards. And it says, and, and it says, and they were judged. The dead were judged, every man according to their works. You know what the result of that is? Being judged according to their works? And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. It was death. It was God's judgment upon them, condemnation upon them. And it says in verse 15, And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So notice how there's this other book. And it's very clear to tell you that the dead are those that are judged out of the things that are written in the books according to their works. But you know what everybody else is not judged by? They're not judged by the things that are written in the books. They're not judged by their works according to their works. Do you know what's the only thing that mattered? One thing. That their name was written in the book of life. Now do you know what that book is also referred to as in the book of Revelation? The Lamb's Book of Life. Amen. It's called the Lamb's Book of Life. So, do you know what, do you know what the only thing? Because I talked about how there are no exclusions from this judgment. There is no amnesty. There is no, there, there, there is no you know, a, a immunity that is given to anyone. Right? But there is one exception to that. One exception to that to those that are not going to have to stand in that line and be judged. 
Do you know what it is? It says, it's if the lamb's blood has been applied to your doorpost. That's the only exception. That's it. Do you know the only thing that allowed the Israelites not to be judged? It was not because they were an Israelite. That's not why they were not judged that night when the death angel came. It had nothing to do with Abraham being their father. And it had nothing, I want you to think about this, to do with their works. It didn't matter how good or how bad they were. I guarantee you there were some pretty bad Israelites. I guarantee you there were some pretty evil. We could go through the book of Exodus and read about some of the people, Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. Now, of course, this is a symbol, a picture, but it, it, it paints a picture and proves a point. There were some bad people that were Israelites. There were some really bad people that were Israelites. But do you know what they did also? They took the blood and they applied it to their doorpost. To the lintel, and then it says to the side post. Of course, forming the cross. They applied it to their door. So, so notice what, what God... He, did, he didn't even question how good they were. He didn't question were they righteous enough, how they were living their lives. He didn't question... He didn't, he didn't see how often they went to church. He didn't see how often they read their Bible. Not to say, of course, we shouldn't keep God's commandments. Totally different subject. Of course, we should keep God's commandments because we love Him. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. We should keep His commandments so we are blessed, so we're not punished by God while on this earth physically. But when it comes to salvation, the only thing that gives you that exclusion or that amnesty, the only thing that separates you from being with the world and being among the Egyptians is if the Lamb's blood is at your doorpost. Is if the lamb's blood has been applied to the lentil and to the side post. There were a lot of bad Israelites and a lot of good Israelites. There were a lot of, I'm sure there were Israelites that were murderers. I'm sure there were Israelites that were adulterers. I'm sure there were Israelites that were thieves that did horrible things. But do you know what they had? They weren't judged according to their works. They didn't, he didn't open up those books. Right? All he did was make sure one thing, just one thing that the blood was applied to the doorpost. On the day of judgment, on the day of judgment, there's only going to be one thing that matters. It's only going to be one thing. Is your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life? There's going to be a lot of people that day that are going to stand there and we're going to hear person after person. You know, the, the, the father, maybe, maybe the deacon at the Methodist church, maybe the priest at the Catholic church. You're going to hear the Buddhist monk. You're going to hear just person after person stand before God. And do you know what they're going to say over and over and over again? You know, I realize I did those things, but look at all the, the good things that I did. Look at all, what about all the good that I did? What about all the people that I helped? What did Jesus say in Matthew 7? Many shall say unto me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? These are people that think that they're a Christian. These are people that claim the name of Christ. And they're going to say, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? Didn't we preach in your name? And in thy name cast out devils? And then they say this, and in thy name done many wonderful works? They're going to be person after person standing there and saying, look at all the good things that I did. Look at the good life that I lived. Look at, all, of the, look at, look at the, all the money that I gave to charity. Look at all the times that I helped my neighbor. Look at all the good that I did. But it's not going to help them. It's not going to matter. Every single Egyptian died that night, as far as the firstborn. Every house, there was no house that was not smitten by the death angel. None. No exemptions. Every single one of them. Their good works didn't help them at all. Whatever good that they did do, I guarantee you that morally there were some Egyptians that were better than the Israelites. I want you to think about that. I guarantee you that you could find some Egyptians that lived, a, 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 according to God's law, that lived a better life. Just morally. Right and wrong, keeping right and wrong, not committing adultery. And you could find some real horribly wicked, bad Israelites. I'm sure of it. But do you know what saved them? Their name was written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Do you remember the, the, par the parable that Jesus tells? You know, he, he talks about sending out, sending out the, the messenger because he's got a wedding. You know, he sends out and he invites guests, and they're like, no, I'm too busy. I have some oxen that I haven't tried. I have a piece of land that I haven't, I need to go look at. 
They're not interested. And you know what he says? He says, go out and find bad and good and bring them in. Go get the bad and the good and bring them in. He brings in the bad and the good. He tells another parable very similar to this where he, he casts a net and gets the bad and the good. So he brings the bad and the good in. And no, it, it had nothing to do with, with a man being bad or a man being good. But he cast somebody out. Do you remember who it was? It was the man who didn't have the wedding garment. It was the man who didn't have the blood applied at his doorpost. On the day of judgment, there's only going to be one thing that matters. Is the blood applied at the doorpost of your heart. It's going to be the only thing. If you want amnesty, if you want to be immune, if you want to, if you want to make sure that you're excluded from that, that final judgment, you've got to make sure that that blood is applied to your doorpost. You know what this should do for all of us that are saved and know for, for sure that we're going to be over here with the Israelites or over here with the saved? We should, we should tell as many people as we can that it's just as easy as striking that blood on the doorpost. It's just as easy as smiting the blood on the doorpost. We should tell them about the way to get to heaven. We should go out and spread the good news as much as possible. Amen. How easy is it? It's just as easy as striking the blood on the doorpost and Jesus said, I am the door. And all you got to do is enter in. It's that easy. It's just as easy as taking a drink of water as eating a piece of bread. And once you drink of it, you'll never thirst again. It's powerful enough that you put it on there once, it's never coming off. Let's tell people about how easy it is to be put into that Lamb's Book of Life. Amen. And let this be sobering to remind you of, of how terrible of a day the Great White Throne Judgment is going to be. It's not going to be a, a, a joyful day. It's going to be a very, very, very sad day. I, you know, it's joyful that we'll be saved. Amen. I'll be, I'm, I'm so thankful and so grateful that I'm saved. And on me, the second death will have no power. Amen. I'm so thankful. But we are going to have to watch person after person cast into hell. People you know, people you don't know. Let's try to get a few more people over on the side of the Israelites. Over on the side of the saved. Let's tell a few more people of how easy it is to strike that blood on the doorpost. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you, dear Lord, for your mercy. We thank you, dear God, that you are a just God uh, and that you are a God of judgment. And that you're not a pushover, dear Lord, but you're someone to be respected and, and to uh, revere, dear Lord. Uh, we ask you that you, would, uh, that you would please bless us, dear Lord God, and that you would uh, be with our church, dear Lord, that you would help this to resonate with us, the importance of uh, the day of judgment, the significance, and, and what a fearful day that that will be, dear God, for many reasons, uh, but that that would compel us, dear God, and, and by your spirit that you would uh, compel us and, and guide us out into the highways and the hedges and to tell people about uh, the blood of the Lamb and, and how, just how easy it is. You just have to put it on the doorpost. You just have to put all of your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. We're thankful uh, for giving us a way out. We're thankful that you made a way for us. And we love you so much for it. And uh, help us to, to, to show it more so each day. In Jesus Christ's name, amen.